sir. Thank you so much. It's been neat for me to hear each each week that I've been with you all what y'all are up to, and y'all are doing a lot of good work, so thank you. Um, I, I think I recognize you all, but I'll just give you a 30 second uh, introduction. My name is Art Wright. I'm a professor at Baptist Theological Seminary here at Richmond. Um, and my, I did my PhD here in town at Union Presbyterian Seminary, so I have some good Presbyterian roots uh, at the same time. Um, and this is our third week together, uh, and we'll go one more week. Uh, so just kind of um, to refresh, uh, your minds. Uh, Jesus has entered Jerusalem rather provocatively uh, with this sort of um, uh, processional that, that mimics an imperial processional, uh, except instead of a war horse, he's on a donkey. Um, then last week we arrested Jesus. This week we're going to try Jesus. Uh, he'll, he'll appear before Pilate, and then next week we'll execute Jesus. Um, so that's sort of where we're headed. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, it's interesting, as we um, uh, make our way um, into this text today, we're going to read John's Roman trial of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all spend a lot of time on the Jesus' trial before the Jewish authorities, uh, and then they just kind of breeze through the trial before Pilate. John flips that. Uh, he, he breezes through Jesus' appearance before Caiaphas uh, and the other Jewish authorities, and then spends so much time with Jesus interacting with Pilate. Uh, so it's really interesting. And so we're actually going to spend a lot of time reading text today uh, in John. Uh, and and I'm, I'm hoping we can make it through it. Um, and if not, we'll just talk it next week and we'll, we'll make it work. Um, let, me, let me give you kind of a, a short orientation. Do we have any lawyers in the room? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Usually we do. <laughs> Good. All right. So <laughs> we're going to talk a little briefly about Roman justice. And I'm going to put justice in quotation marks because when we think of justice uh, in 21st century America, we have certain assumptions, right? Maybe we can just, um, and what do you think of when you hear justice? Just briefly. Due process under the law. Due process under, under the law. Trial by jury. Trial by jury. Fairness, hopefully. Determining innocent or guilt. What else? A fair innocent punishment. A fair punishment, yep. Uh, and whether you're, you know, rich or poor, or whatever, we like to think that the, the punishment reflects the crime, not who you are. Yep. Innocent until proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty, absolutely. Wane of evidence. Uh, these are good. Yeah, this is sort of what we think of. <laughs> trial by jury of your peers. Yeah, trial by jury of your peers, yes. Not, none so, of, not so much. <laughs> none of this is really true <laughs> uh, in the first century Roman Empire. <clears throat> so a few thoughts. Um, so. So now we sort of separate military, government, administrative, judicial, and priestly functions. So, you know, separation of powers. None of that's really true in the first century. So Pilate uh, is, it, you know, oversees the military, the government, the administrative functions. He also would be the sort of the chief person with the power to conduct trials like this. So he, he's fulfilling a judicial function in the scene that we're going to read. Um, so if you're a member of the ruling elite, remember we're in an, an aristocratic empire, you also serve at, in a, a judicial function. Um, and justice of the sort that we just described is not really a principal concern when you're the Roman governor of a province. Um, rather the concern is to maintain order and Roman control of this province that you're taxing you know, you're getting tax money from it sent back to Rome, and you're, you know, getting rich, lining your pockets with it. Uh, so you're, you're really attempting to maintain the status quo, uh, imperial hegemony, and tax revenue of the elite. All right, those are sort of your principal goals. There's also this um, acute legal bias. If you're a member of the elite, uh, chances are you're going to fare pretty well in a trial. If you're, uh, you know at the bottom of the social ladder like Jesus, 
you don't really stand a chance. Uh, you're, the, the penalties are going to be harsher, the outcomes are going to be poorer, you're not going to be tried by your peers. Uh, if, if you remember uh, last week, I think we sort of, was it last week or two weeks ago, I showed you like the social stratification of the Roman Empire. Pilate was at the top and Jesus was at the bottom, right? Uh, yes? Also, <clears throat> what, that, that, that if you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. Yes. But if you were not, or I get, but wasn't, it wasn't Jesus a Roman citizen? No. Uh, he, so, uh, he was born in Nazareth? So you're right. Roman citizens typically wouldn't be crucified. Right. Jesus is a provincial. He, you know, he's just a, he's a nobody in, in, in a province of Rome, Judea. Um, and so, uh, so he definitely has a, a good shot at crucifixion. Um, <laughs> so um, let, me, let me read you a quick quote that I think um, uh, that sort of situates, situates us. So um, uh, Matthew Skinner observes the foundational question beneath a, a governor's ruling in criminal cases was not necessarily has this person broken a law? Uh, the inquiry was more along the lines of, has this person done anything that endangers social we welfare or threatens Roman values? Uh, and the answer to that question is, yeah, yes, he has. Um, so, so what's best for Rome? We don't, Pilate's not really gonna care whether Jesus is innocent or guilty, and we're gonna wrestle with that a little bit when we're reading the text. But, but um, Pilate is sort of thinking, what's best for Rome? What's best for me? I don't want the Roman emperor to, to, to take away my governorship, uh, which he does in 36, so just a few years later. Um, and anyway, I don't think Jesus is innocent according to Rome. Uh, anyway, he's claimed to be a king. But, you know, that's guilty. We, we think of him as innocent sort of from our spiritual point of view, but from a political point of view, Jesus is He's kind of guilty. Um, so, so that should shape our understanding as we go into this text. Um, so when I, when I read this scene, I, I often call it a show trial. Uh, it's not a trial in the sense that we would think of trials. Uh, it's a political tool that benefits the elites. Uh, I think that the outcome is fairly certain from the start. I, I think there's a pretty good chance going into this trial that Jesus is going to die. He's, he's, we've said he's an unsanctioned king. Uh, they've already collaborated to arrest him. Remember last week they sent 600 Roman soldiers to arrest him. Uh, do you think they're just going to let him go after that? Um, uh, Pilate has very little to benefit from releasing Jesus, right? Uh, he, pro he probably doesn't care. Um, and Jesus has predicted his death. The Jewish authorities obviously think it's a good idea to kill him. So, so when I read this scene, uh, really I read it as this sort of tensive negotiation and political maneuvering on the part of Pilate and the Jewish authorities for political gain. All right, and Jesus is sort of stuck in the middle, uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Was it public or not? That's a great question. Uh, it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, in John, it does not mention a crowd. So it's, it's uh, as we read it, you'll notice it's just <laughs> Pilate, Jesus, and the Jewish elite. Uh, go back and read the Synoptic Gospels, and there is a crowd. In fact, I realized I put this picture up here. This would not be a good um, artistic representation of, of John's trial, because Pilate's looking out into the streets to the crowd. They're not present in the Gospel of John. so. Does, so does that shape your sort of understanding as we go in? Well, yeah. One thing I, you might want to factor in is that Rome, Rome had created this body of the laws. <coughs> the law was a big deal in the Roman Empire. Now, whether it applied to all levels that you're indicating is another story, but Powell in the end had some qualms about, execute, about this final decision he was making. And so maybe, I don't know, what do you, what do you think of that? So we're, we will wrestle with that as we read the text. And I will be honest, I have wrestled with it over the years as I've sort of struggled to understand this text. 
I'm going to pitch this angle, and then we'll see if you agree with me by the okay. end. Uh, in, in this sort of scenario, where the crowd is rowdy, I think something different is at stake. He doesn't want to incite a revolt. In this scenario, when we read the Gospel of John, it's behind closed doors. Uh, he could, you know, Pilate has a lot more latitude, and, um, and, and really he's trying to, we'll see at the end, he pries something out of the Jewish authorities. So let me, let me um, uh, step forward just a little bit uh, to try to set this up a little bit more. Um, let's see, here we go. All right, this is the outline of the trial. We're gonna try to read all of this. We might have to, to, um, to go quickly through a couple of areas, but it breaks really cleanly into seven scenes. Uh, starting at 1828, John 1828. Uh, and notice I, I indicated the location of each scene, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside. So Pilate is going outside of the praetorium and he's com coming back in. And the Jewish authorities are outside, sort of standing at the door, evidently. And Jesus is inside. So you can see Pilate's talking to the Jewish elite, and he's talking to Jesus, and he's talking to the Jewish elite, uh, and so forth. And so who's the central figure of this trial? It, it revolves around Pilate. Yeah, he's the, he's the one character always present. Right. Now, um, Pilate has often been interpreted as weak, uh, really throughout Christian history by interpreters, uh, seen as this politician who's favorable to Jesus, uh, but in the end, capitulates to the Jewish authorities' request to crucify him. Um, I, I have sort of tried to, tried to argue already that I don't think that that's the case. Um, a couple reasons uh, why I don't think we should read him as weak. One, he's the most powerful imperial person in the province. He has the entire might of Rome behind him. Uh, he, we've already seen 600, his, his cohort, his 600 soldiers that are backing him. So he's already made a display of Roman military might. Uh, we're going to see him mocking the Jewish authorities throughout the trial. Um, uh, we're going to see him eliminate a threat to Rome, Jesus. Uh, and at the end of the trial, he's going to elicit this Roman pledge of allegiance from the Jewish authorities. Uh, it's sort of this gotcha moment. Uh, the, the Jewish authorities, I'm going to spoil it just, just to try to make this point. They say, we have no king but the emperor, which is antithetical to everything the Jewish people say they believe. Uh, and so they sort of pledge, pledge allegiance to Rome. Uh, and then Pilate hands him over to be crucified. So it's a sort of gotcha moment in the narrative. Um, so a lot of scholars have now started reading Pilate as this strong politician who's actually sort of playing the Jewish authorities. It's, it's a tense of negotiation be, to be sure, but in the end he gets something he wants uh, from the Jewish authorities. All right. Um, yeah, let's, I think everything else will come out from there. Can I pause for just a second before we jump into reading the text? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Pause for questions. I'm just going to catch my breath. Um, yes, sir. Well, you said something about Jesus not being the authorized or sanctioned king because his crime wasn't that supposedly he claimed to be king. Herod claimed to be king, and that was okay because he'd been approved by Rome. The issue was yes. he was an unapproved king. Right, Rome gets to decide who's king. Herod, members of the Herodian dynasty, they are, um, they're called client kings. It's um, you know when an empire installs someone to rule on your behalf. Uh, they didn't do that for Jesus, and yet he's, walk, you know, he's, he's claiming kingship. And that motif, the, the kingship motif, is gonna be really prominent in this scene. Unsanctioned kings die uh, in the Roman Empire. If you read Josephus and some other uh, historians in antiquity. Rome kills unsanctioned kings. So, yeah. But his kingdom wasn't of this world. That is going to come up in this in this discussion. Yes. So we'll have to wrestle with that too. Yeah. So hang on to that thought. Well, let's let's jump in and read. Um, 
So we're going to start at 1828 and read those, those first few verses. Someone want to get us set up 1828 to, to verse 32. I will. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Thank you. So they take him to the, uh, I think your translation said, um, the Pilate's headquarters. The, the, the Greek word and the Latin word that it's based on is praetorium. This is uh, where, where the chief Roman official in a province, in an occupied territory, lives. Uh, so right, right from the beginning of this text, uh, we sort of have this signal that Jesus is, is moving into uh, the heart of imperial power, of Roman imperial power, all right? If it, uh, it's sort of a good reminder, all right? Um, a, a couple of interesting things going on against this in this text. They don't, the Jewish authorities don't enter the headquarters so as to be ritually pure so they can eat the Passover. Uh, there's a little bit of an irony here. They're about to become murderers in some sense, uh, and yet they're anxious to maintain ritual purity, right? That's uh, <laughs> good. I'm glad you kind of chuckled at that. Um, <laughs> Uh, notice it doesn't call Pilate governor. It doesn't even say Pontius Pilate. He's only ever Pilate here. Uh, and so Jesus is really the only titled ruler present in the scene. So I think that's maybe like a subtle nuance that the author is, is, um, is working. Uh, they don't say they brought him before the governor. They just brought him to Pilate. All right. Uh, what accusation do you bring against this man? couple things. He's already sent Roman troops to arrest him. Do you think this is a sincere request? Like what, you know, why are you bringing this guy to me? Uh, it could be that it's actually a formal request for an ac for an accusation, sort of like, uh, you know, you come before the, the judge. The judge has already read that, you know, the, I don't know, what do, you, what do judges read beforehand? Something, right? Uh, he, he, what's that? A complaint. Yeah, so he knows why they're bringing him to him. This is sort of a formal request for the accusation. And did you notice that their answer is sort of a non-answer? Uh, we would, and they say, uh, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. <laughs> so this is not a very good accusation. Um, arrogant. What's that? It's arrogant, it actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Greek word uh, basically is evildoer. If this man were not an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Pilate says, take him yourselves uh, and judge him according to your law. And then the Jews curiously reply, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Uh, Pilate may be sort of taunting them, saying, y'all go kill him yourselves. And they're like, actually, we need you to do it. Uh, sort of a reminder that they're subservient to Rome that Rome is the, is the big dog in this, in this play, all right? Um, yeah, we can't kill him, but we know you can on our behalf, all right? Let me, let me pause for a second and see what stands out to you, um, or if you have any questions, or if you want to push back at all. Almost seemed a little bit to me, like Pilate's having a little bit of fun here and playing the high priest, it, knowing that he, he knows all the answers to it. He knows they can't kill him, and he's just setting all this up, maybe. I mean, 
who knows, but maybe he's setting all this up to get what he wants at the end of the day. Yes. As you teed it up yes. before. And that's how I'm reading Is it. He... He's toying with them and reminding, reminding them of their subservient status uh, as provincials. And just kind of getting them, without him telling them that, he's getting them kind of to admit it by going through all these. Right. He's antagonizing them. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, and it's going to get beneath their skin, for sure. Yeah. There, there seems to be an element of cover your rear end in his <laughs> responses of kind of trying to get them to say things that he doesn't have to say. Right. Uh, okay. I, was I was reading forward, but yeah, it seems yeah. to be a little bit of that as well. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's a good transition. Let's read the next scene. Uh, uh, so uh, verses 33 to 38a, all right? Uh, and mine, mine has a clean paragraph break after the first half of verse 38. So let's, will someone read that for us? I'm not volunteering. I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the things we take for granted now that appears to not be present here is uh, if you're charged with something, you're entitled to know what you're charged with. Oh, yeah. And Pilate says, all right, why, why are you here? He asked Jesus because he didn't know. And all, all that Herod and his followers have said is, well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. So what, what's he charged with? Right. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. Uh, there's, there's been no reading of one's Miranda rights or anything like that. Yeah, that's good. Well, other parentheses in my book is got oh. chapter 32. Yeah, verse 32. Uh, so this is interesting. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said so there's sort of, the, the, the author is sort of inserting this theological rationale into the text. It's not in parentheses in the Greek text. They didn't have parentheses. Okay. Um, but this is sort of an editorial decision to sort of say, this is the narrator talking and say, by the way, um, the, Jews could, the Jewish authorities could have stoned him. In fact, they had tried to stone him earlier in the narrative. Uh, but, but one of the reasons this is unfolding this way is because Jesus uh, needs to be crucified. Right. He needs to be lifted up uh, in, the, in the terminology of the fourth gospel. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So let's read this. Um, uh, where are we? Yeah, the second scene. So Pilate entered the headquarters. Someone want to read that? I'm going to read it. Thanks. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You ask this of your own, or did others tell you about me? I forget how far to go. Uh, through, why don't you read through the end of the chapter? All right. I'm worried we won't make it otherwise. Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But, that, but as, as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. <coughs> Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? You can go through the end of the chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Awesome. So question, what, that, that was marvelously, marvelously read. What tone of voice are you hearing Pilate use? Uh, I think the, the way that you hear Pilate speaking influences your interpretation. This, especially with this um, what is truth question. Is he sincere? Is he like, Psh, what is truth? Um, sort of disdainful. Uh, how, how are you hearing Pilate? I, I hear him 
people have been wondering what truth is about all the time, and he's yeah. just saying, oh, you know, here you go again. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you don't think he really wants an answer to that I question? Don't. I don't. And he doesn't stick around for it. He goes right back outside. It's like, yeah. what is truth? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I tend to agree. <laughs> Uh, it is anybody else tone of voice that you sort of hear in your head for pilot Some folks have some interpreters have heard this as a genuine like what what is truth tell me uh, But then it's curious that he doesn't stick around to wait for the answer and it is uh, Ironic in the sense that um, the person who embodies truth is standing right in front of him And he can't see it like what is truth? Tr truth is standing right in front of you, and you don't see it uh, and you're eventually going to crucify uh, that's true. All right. Don't you see how Pilate is uh, having two titles, governor and judge? Uh, and in, in his uh, role as uh, judge, he says, I don't have a, I don't have a case against uh, this, this guy. But as governor, I want to keep peace. Hmm. Therefore, okay. I turn him over to you. To uh, Otherwise, there'll be a riot against my authority. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, and that has been a, a common interpretation um, that he's trying to keep the peace and trying to sort of mm -hmm. negotiate his desire to placate the Jewish elite and also not stir up a riot. Yeah, um, it's and and so that comes through a lot more clearly in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Here in John, we haven't heard of anything about a crowd. It's mm -hmm. when when they say the Jews, uh, it's. If, if we're reading this in context, it's, it's really clear that it's just the Jewish elite. Uh, what, maybe a couple dozen, you know, rich Jewish aristocratic people, high priestly, and so forth. Um, uh, so, uh, a couple of things. We need to come back to my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, my kingdom... What do you make of this? My kingdom is not of this world. That's not where Jesus, Jesus is not part of this place, <clears throat> this particular time. Okay. And I don't hear Jesus calling himself a king in this passage either. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Even though he has a kingdom? We all live in a kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The people who live in the kingdom of England my, oh, okay, so he's not claiming this I, is my kingdom. All right. In, that's the way I hear that's, yeah, gotcha. his voice. Yeah. Anybody else? My, my kingdom is not of, uh, I think my translation renders it from, it's actually the same Greek word. Uh, the way I have, have begun to read it is my kingdom is not of the quality uh, of kingdom that is of this world, if that sort of makes sense. My, my kingdom is not of the sort of this world. If it were so, uh, my followers would have been fighting to keep me from being handed over to you. So my kingdom is not of the violent sort. Uh, uh, kingdom empire, we could read, read that as empire, um, same Greek word. Uh, so my kingdom is nonviolent. Uh, and we've seen that in the last two weeks now. Uh, Jesus enters evoking um, one of the Psalms uh, to, to suggest this nonviolent king. Uh, last week, Peter <coughs> swipes the guy's ear off, and Jesus says, you know, put your sword away. All right? So, so one way to read this is to, to hear Jesus saying, my kingdom's not like your kingdom. Uh, it is in the world, it's, it's physically in the world because my followers are in the world, uh, but it's not of the world. It's not of the same quality of the world. How's that, how's that? Right on. Okay. Right on, it's, it's the ether of everything else but kings and lordship and rulers and battles. And it's got to do with human condition and, and the future of the human race. Yeah, my vision sort of for what, what it could be, <coughs> right? All right. Um, notice Jesus interrogates Pilate. He sort of flips the tables. Uh, and can you imagine this? The Roman governor and then this peasant. And Jesus ends up asking him questions. Uh, so there's this sort of um, judgment motif. 
who's really on trial here? <laughs> I mean, yeah, Jesus is for sure, but there's certainly a strong sense that Pilate is also on trial. Yeah. How, how old is Pilate? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I don't know. He's been in charge. He ruled from 20, uh, 26 to 36 CE and was sent back to Rome in 36. And I meant to look up why he was sent back to Rome. I can't remember. Um, but he did botch something, and the emperor was like, he, he yanked the chain, you know. Bad, bad travel vouchers. Yes, that's right. Probably so. Yeah. Um, that's funny. That still happens today. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Wright? Yes, sir. Do we have to remember the time this is being written? If, if God was going to interrupt human history at the time of the death and resurrection of Jesus, that would have been in the 30s. Uh -huh. AD. This is being written much, much later. Yeah. So there was no interruption of human history. There was no overthrow in any political sense. The Romans won, in fact, when the Jews revolted. Mm -hmm. So the writer of John can't seems to me, argue that at any moment the Roman Empire is going to be displaced and, and Israel is going to be restored. He's got to come up with a spiritual interpretation mm -hmm. and he's come up with this beautiful idea of the kingdom that is not literal, it's spiritual. Mm -hmm. But still, still perhaps has literal implications. If to Pilate, yes. Pilate's not going to nuance this thing. Sure. But on the other hand, this is being written long after Pilate's dead. Yeah. But still maybe describes a way of being in the empire that's antithetical to the empire's sort of ideology uh, and, and, and demands a, um, a, a different uh, understanding of lordship, not with Caesar as lord, but Jesus as lord. Um, uh, yeah, it's... it's so it's, it's not violent active resistance, but it is a type of resistance, I would say, to Roman imperial ideology. Let me, um, let me say one more thing. Barabbas uh, is described as a bandit. Uh, we can also read that as insurrectionist. Insurrectionist. Did I get that right? Insurrection. Yeah, close enough. Uh, <laughs> a violent revolutionary, right? Uh, and so they have this choice. Someone who is violently trying to overthrow the empire or someone else they perceive as a threat. And who do they choose? <laughs> this guy. Sort of interesting. Who do you perceive as a greater threat? Uh, and they think Jesus is the greater threat. Uh, because he represents this type of ideological resistance. And I think we see sort of in the world today that it's really hard to kill an ideology uh, with, with violence. Um, all right. All right, let's, let's keep moving a little bit. Um, uh, let's see, let's, let's read through, let's, well, let's just read the next three verses. Will someone read 19, one through three? And this is notice at the heart of the passage of this text that we're reading. So it may, may warrant some special focus. Someone wanna read that for us? I'll read it. Thanks. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in, purple ro in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. That's the read. That's perfect. Yep. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, tortured, right? Uh, violent torture. Um, and the, then there's this sort of um, ironic moment. The soldiers dress him up like king uh, and come and say, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, if you're uh, coronating a king or emperor, you're going to dress them up, and, and uh, eventually you're going to bring them out and say, uh, Hail, Caesar. And here they say, Hail, King of the Jews. So this is sort of like a mock investiture of Jesus as king. They're toying with him, all right? And Carolyn, this is where I'm sort of left wondering, uh, is, is he a king or isn't he a king? Uh, 
What do you think? What, what's, so they don't think he's a king. What are we given to think? Do they speak more truth than they know in saying, Hail, King of the Jews? A Messiah wouldn't be a king. A Messiah is a human agent acting on behalf of, of God. So he's the anointed. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could elevate from the idea of anointing, yeah. you could elevate to a, to a royal figure. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's interesting. Messiah means anointed. Right. Uh, uh, what do you do with kings in ancient Israel? You anoint them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's so, an elevation. So they, w they would have understood. Messiah and king are going to sound very similar, I think, to Jewish ears. Um, you, you don't think so? No. Okay. Uh, so, so it's almost like the, the people have put this tag on Jesus as being king versus Jesus coming out and saying, I am king almost. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, it's almost like they have elevated into that status, but he he's wants to gain the more humility, meekness, mm -hmm. you know, of the people. This is maybe so. sort of what we saw two weeks ago with the triumphal entry. Uh, I, yes, I will bear that title king, but it's not of the sort that you think. Yeah. It's interesting. They dress him up in a crown in purple, and they, they won't... It, it never narrates them undressing him. Uh, every other gospel, it says, then they take the robe off and send him to be crucified. Jesus goes to the cross dressed up as a king in this gospel. Uh, and sort of in the theological world of, of this gospel, <coughs> Jesus' crucifixion is his enthronement as king. Um, yeah, this is his moment of glorification. Uh, and it, it is sort of pushing back against this understand well, and we'll talk about this next week, this understanding of crucifixion in the Roman Empire. Uh, John kind of flips it. Uh, this isn't Jesus' greatest shame, it's his greatest triumph as king. Uh, I never noticed that about them not taking the robe off. That's an interesting visual. Yeah. Yeah, carry that with you um, through all the way through next week. <clears throat> he looks like a king. That's interesting. Yeah. Yep. Every other gospel will say that, but John won't. Right? And I, I think that may be deliberate. All right, let's keep, let's keep going. Um, um, three, four through 11, maybe. All right. Anybody want to read that for us? I'll read it. Yeah. Four through 11? Yes. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. <coughs> Pilate said to them, Take him your, yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he is claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Well, let's, uh, let's read one more. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. Hmm. So a lot going on here. <coughs> so often when this verse, these passages are read, uh, there's this thought that, that Pilate flogs Jesus uh, and then brings him out sort of bloody and battered. <laughs> say, look, here I already 
I already tortured him, just let him go. Uh, John doesn't seem to have that in mind, because when he brings him out, the text doesn't say, and out came Jesus, bloodied and battered. It says, he comes out dressed like a king, uh, is, is in a purple robe and a, and a crown. So, so John is sort of emphasizing this kingly appearance of Jesus. Pilate evidently isn't trying to get Jesus out of this by just torturing him. Um, now, I think we just read twice where it says, I find no case against him. Uh, this, is this is something that, that I really struggle with, uh, sort of in, in my, my attempt to understand this passage. Does he really find no case against him? Uh, or is he just using this to antagonize the Jewish authorities? Let me read you one, one quote by a, a scholar named David Rensberger. He says, it's possible for Pilate to proclaim Jesus' innocence without himself believing in it or caring about it. Uh, so he actually thinks Pilate is indifferent to Jesus' faith. Again, he's just sort of antagonizing the Jewish authorities. He says, you take him and crucify him, uh, which he knows they can't do. The Jewish authorities can't crucify him. Uh, so he's sort of talking out of both sides of his mouth, I think. I find myself and have for years feeling really sorry for Pilate. I find him a, a very vacillating person, but a person not unlike I think many people today, he, I think he wants to do what is right, <coughs> but he's got too many people on either side around him that are actually, actually, even the people have more power than he does because he recognizes that, to me, that, that there is a custom every year that he could free someone, mm -hmm. but he knows not to just automatically do it. He asks them who should he free, and they say Barabbas. Well, I mean, he, he can't, in, in his own, in defense of himself, <coughs> I think he wants to keep his job. <laughs> well, certainly. And he's he wants for his to keep interest. his life. Yeah. And I think that really he's a very, uh, every man of today, actually. And this is kind of a common interpretation of Pilate. Uh, in fact, I've heard a scholar say he's sort of, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> we see ourselves reflected in Pilate trying to discern the truth. I'm trying to push against that interpretation a little bit, and you can judge whether I do it successfully or not, but uh, it's hard for me to feel sorry for Pilate when he is um, this, this uber elite uh, Roman governor who um, is portrayed by historians as cruel, um, you know, who doesn't really care about, about you know, folks down here. Uh, it's sort of like saying you feel sorry for Donald Trump. Po <laughs> politics aside, you know, this is a, someone who's very wealthy, who, who has chosen this life of power and influence. Uh, it, well, I, I agree with you. I remember reading somewhere that Pilate had gotten in trouble for overly, overly being hard. And that says a lot for someone in the Roman Empire. So I think he was walking a line so he didn't get fired by being too gruff. He, yeah, he has a not a great reputation right. uh, for being a nice guy. Right. He's, he's not a nice guy. He, he's a, he's I mean, a, even the Roman Empire thought he was overly cruel. And, that, and Yeah, and that's why he was deposed in 36. I don't remember the specific details, but he's a, uh, a cruel, calculating politician right. uh, in, in the history books. And so I'm trying to read that through this lens because I think it's more uh, realistic to think that that's how John's first audience would have read it. Uh, but back in, the, back in the days of the Roman Empire, you didn't get to be powerful or high-ranking um, by being a nice guy. Right. <laughs> um, and if you want to liken it 
to, to the days of our early years of slavery when just even nice Christian men and women, but men owned slaves. It was, it was customary to be <coughs> harsh and to be severe with your slaves. And, uh, and, and remember uh, Paul's letter to whoever it is about the Venesimus about the uh, slave. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was the custom. Uh, you wouldn't find many gentle rulers of mm -hmm. any of any description. You, you know, Rome is a they, uh, they, you know big empire, small ruling elite. It's you know we have a pretty good bureau bureaucracy in America today. Uh, Pilate just has a few you know uh, folks that he's brought from Rome with him, and then he's got his military strength. So you you know you stamp down, you tamp down pretty harshly. Uh, that's that's the tendency. Let me point out one more thing, uh, and then I want to read this last little sliver. Uh, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he's claimed to be the son of God. Now, Pilate heard this, and he was he was um, more afraid than ever. Uh, the Greek is a little a little confusing. You can read that as uh, Pilate then then became very afraid. Uh, so it's unclear, is he, is he nervous, is he afraid? Uh, son of God is going to sound different to different people, but uh, the, the Roman emperors, many of them were deified when they died. Uh, so Julius Caesar dies, he's deified, uh, and then Caesar Augustus becomes son of God. So if you're, if you're a Roman governor and you hear someone has claimed to be a son of God, you're thinking, well, I might be thinking, yeah, right, uh, but you might be thinking, is he, is he really going to contest the throne? Um, so he comes back and says, where are you from? Which ruler are you descended from, or which god are you descended from? Um, that's so interesting sort of resonance in the Roman world with this, this phrase. Um, Let's, let's uh, try to land the plane. We have five minutes. Um, so let's read verses 13 through 16a. Uh, or, yeah, you, you can just read 13 through 16. Anybody? When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench, a place called the Stone of Pavement, or the Hebrew Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? <coughs> the chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed them over, then he handed him over to be crucified. Perfect. Uh, so this is the conclusion. Pilate, Pilate brings him out, sits him on the, the bima, the judge's bench. Uh, who, who's sitting on the judge's bench? Uh, you said it brought Jesus outside and sat. Sounds like Pilate is sitting on the judge's bench. Anybody have a footnote there? It says we're seated him. Yeah. The Greek is unclear, actually, about who is sitting on the judge's bench. Remember before I said, who's really on trial here? There's sort of a, a little play on the Greek wording. Uh, you know, uh, on one level, of course, Pilate's sitting on the judge's bench and, and serving as judge. But, uh, but there's sort of this wink in the narrative that he actually sets Jesus down, and then J Jesus is, is serving as judge. Uh, and they're, gonna, they're not going to pass the test, right? Um, it's the day of preparation for the Passover. Uh, let's hang on to that thought for next week. But they're about to slaughter the Paschal lambs. All right, that that may be significant. All right, uh, here is your king. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, "We have no king but the emperor." Uh, this is exactly what Pilate wanted them to say. This is this Roman pledge of allegiance. 
uh, reminding them of their subject status, uh, getting them to unequivocally pledge their loyalty to the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, of course, throughout history, Israel has uh, understood that it has one, one king, right? Uh, God, right? And here so they sort of they reveal their true colors and renounce their faith uh, in favor of Rome. All right. So uh, we have a couple minutes left, uh, and yeah, we'll we'll just see how it goes. I think that la this last passage uh, gives a lot of support to your view that that Pilate wasn't just a nice guy equivocating, not sure what to do. He was manipulating, and he got exactly the result he was looking for. At least that's how I read it. But one of the thoughts that I'm left with, of course, Jesus didn't have counsel present, but <laughs> it's still not clear what he was charged with. Uh, Pilate charges him as being king of the Jews, and that's the first time that seems to come up, and yet the Jews there aren't charging him with that. They're charging him with claiming he's the son of God. Two separate accusations. Mm -hmm. and is that an observation or a question? <laughs> I, uh, well, question. I, well, I, mean, I think it's a good observation is that, yeah, that it's a little bit muddled, right? Uh, he has this following. He has entered Jerusalem, uh, you know, on a... Um, on a donkey, has acted like a king, has acted like uh, a messiah figure who's amassing this gathering, Rome has every right to feel a little bit nervous, um, I, I think. Um, and you're right, he doesn't have counsel, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't expect to, I don't think, in this scene. So, yeah. There's a sentence in here that says, it says, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. I want to know who the one is. Oh, oh yeah, me too. Uh, I actually had a note to mention that, and I was just trying to kind of breeze through here. Who is it? Who is the one that handed me over to you that's guilty of a greater sin? Judas, right? All right, that's one option. Yeah, I mean, does one actually mean like one person or one group? Or... Any other options? I'm out. It's the Whatever. great plan of God. I mean. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. That's a twist. I have, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. He hear, Pilate hears that and thinks the emperor. The emperor has put me into power. Jesus is actually saying God is in control. Uh, even though you, you Romans, you know, in your imperial ideology, think that the Roman Caesar are in control. God is in control, and Jesus is sort of directing events here. Um, uh, some folks have said Judas. Uh, it is interesting that the Greek word is, is paradidomi, paradidomi, uh, and it's used to describe both of these parties. Uh, and then look at this, uh, verse 16, then he, Pilate, handed him over to be crucified. So Pilate's going to join the party, too, and, and commit this greater sin as well. Uh, I think it's talking about all of them. Uh, it's a great question. And no one really knows, but, but that's where I think. In, in a way, Pilate fulfilling the will of God here? I mean, you say they're yes. accusing him of, of a sin, but what if that never happened? Yes, yeah, so this is a big, be to that? hard theological question. And, right. and John is trying to help us understand why Jesus was crucified. And in John's worldview, it's because Jesus predicted it. This is the will of God. This is the way things are supposed to go. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Pilate probably didn't realize it doing it. Oh, no. I mean, that's, <laughs> but it, I mean, it seems to me that's just an odd paradox here that he's actually just carrying out the will of God. He thinks he's serving Roman interests, but, uh, but, but yes, in, 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 in this, he's actually serving God's interests. Uh, and the sin, sin uh, in the Gospel of John means rejecting Jesus. Uh, so this is, sort of plays into this judgment motif. Will they, will they accept him? Will they reject him? Uh, and so Pilate, like all the others, ends up rejecting him. All right. I think I need to turn you all loose, uh, but I feel like we have so much more we could say. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come to the... the 
bitter conclusion or the, the grand conclusion next week, depending on how you read it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.